Welcome to Trinity Central. We exist to make God central to our lives and our world. You are listening to a recording of one of our Sunday messages. For more information, please go to trinitycentral.org. All right, well, welcome everybody. My name is James, and I'm going to be taking us through uh, a passage of Philippians. That's the book that we're working on in our sermon series right now. And today we have some practical words from Paul about how to live well as Christians in community, both our church community and also in the larger community. So we're going to be reading from Philippians 4, verses 5, 6, and 7. And Paul says, Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Yeah, dear Father, we come to you uh, as your children, knowing that you have good things for us. And we pray that you would speak to us now, and that we would hear you, Lord, and uh, be obedient to what we hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Well, the first uh, command, really, that Paul gives here is to be reasonable. He says in Philippians 4, verse 5, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Or another translation puts it, have a reputation for gentleness. Uh, Another commentator says uh, that that the word in question means fair-mindedness, the attitude of a man who is charitable towards men's faults and merciful in his judgment of their feelings because he takes their whole situation into his reckoning. So, reasonableness, gentleness, fair-mindedness. These are not necessarily qualities that our culture actually values. Um, We don't usually watch shows on Netflix about reasonable, gentle, or fair-minded people. Um, That's not typically the attitude uh, that I find on social media. Um, Our heroes are so often in your face and violent and aggressive and clever in sort of a put-downy sort of way. There doesn't seem to be a lot of reasonableness and fair-mindedness and gentleness uh, around. Yet Paul reminds us that we are to be like this because Jesus is like this. Uh, You may recall the story from Luke 9. Jesus is on his way with his disciples uh, to Jerusalem. He's going down from Galilee, and he's going straight through. He's going through Samaria. And the Samaritans and the Jewish people uh, were separate peoples, but related. And yet they, they viewed each other with contempt. And when Jesus' disciples go into a Samaritan village in order to organize some accommodation for the night for Jesus and the disciples, they refuse to provide anything. They refuse to welcome them. They snub them. And uh, as James and John, two of his disciples, bring this up to Jesus, they say, Master, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to, to burn this place up? Now, uh, the Roman emperor at the time was Tiberius Caesar, And Tiberius Caesar was an old general uh, who had uh, gotten famous for conquering large parts of Northern Europe and bringing them into the empire. And if Tiberius Caesar had been treated the way that uh, Jesus' disciples were treated, you can be sure that that whole area of the country would have been put to the fire and sword. And yet, as the disciples knew, Jesus was a greater king even than Tiberius Caesar. And so that's why they so kindly offer to Jesus to uh, pray down a Sodom and Gomorrah kind of situation, the fire of heaven upon this village. And what Jesus does is he tells his disciples to smarten up and they go on to the next village. Jesus was reflecting there the character of his father, who despite the fact that the whole world which he created has snubbed him, just like that Samaritan village snubbed Jesus. Uh, Instead of lashing out, our our, our Heavenly Father has reached out, and he's withheld judgment to give people time to repent, time to change their thinking. 
You see, people think that God is like Tiberius Caesar, that he delights to smack down anybody who opposes him, when in fact, the reality of God is in this picture of Jesus sparing that Samaritan village and going on uh, to Jerusalem to lay down his life for the sake of the world. As 2 Peter 3 says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise to return to judge the earth, As some understand slowness, instead he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. There's also a really great example in American history of a man such as Paul describes, somebody who's reasonable, gentle, somebody who's fair-minded. And this is Ulysses S. Grant. He is uh, one of the towering figures of the 19th century, but kind of unlikely He was a quiet, bookish man uh, who was devoted to his wife and to his family. Uh, He had a quiet faith. He was a Methodist. Um, He had an extraordinary bond with horses. Uh, There was a time that he was a a soldier, a young officer in the army, and uh, he bought a horse, a a, a stallion for $12, which even at that time was super cheap. And the reason why it was super cheap was because nobody could ride this horse. Everybody was terrified of it. And what he did was he blindfolded the horse. He put like something over its head, and then he put on the saddle and everything. He climbed up on the saddle. He took off the blindfold and just rode away. And a few hours later, he came back to the camp and the soldier said the, the horse, which had previously refused, nobody had been able to ride, was now perfectly tame. He had an amazing bond with horses and he loved them. In fact, he refused to even go to horse races because he thought they were cruel to the horses. Um, he grew up on the frontier and he was a good shot with a rifle, but he refused to go hunting because he loved animals. And... Uh, as a soldier, as a young man, he, he went to West Point, which was the military academy, and he uh, just kind of squeaked in, actually, and he became a soldier, and he, he gained a reputation for courage under fire and also for great organizational ability. So he kind of rose in the ranks, he became like a major, and he was doing well, but he just missed his wife so much that eventually he just quit. He said, I can't do this anymore. I want to be with my wife. And uh, so he moved back with her and he tried to be a farmer for a while and that didn't really work out. That was a bit of a flop. Um, His dad was a tanner who owned a leather goods store. So he kind of joined the family business and he started uh, to do that. And he was doing reasonably well when the Civil War started uh, in in 1860. Uh, The American North and the American South fought a war because the South wanted to secede over the issue of slavery. The South wanted to keep their slaves. Um... And uh, so Grant joined up for the Northern forces, for the Union forces, because he wanted to do his bit. And shortly he was uh, promoted to a general. They didn't have a lot of capable officers and people remembered that he'd actually done pretty well as a soldier previously. Um, He was a quiet leader. He gave most of his orders in writing. Uh, He never gave one of those stirring William Wallace kind of speeches to his troops uh, like they do in the movies. Uh, In fact, he didn't even look like a general. Half the time he was wearing civilian clothing or he would wear like a private's uniform with just some general stars on his shoulders so people actually knew who the heck he was. And lots of times people didn't know who he was. Um, And he liked to ride around on this little pony, even though he was this amazing horseman. He loved to ride around on this little pony that he called Jeff Davis, which is a little joke for some of you who know his uh, American history, because it was just a really comfortable ride. So he was not a proud man, but he cared well for his troops. And at a time in the war when it seemed like the Union forces, the Northern forces could do nothing but lose, as a general, Grant did nothing but win. This quiet, gentle, and reasonable man was the most bold and decisive general of the entire war, North or South. Um, He was constantly taking the fight to the enemy. When so many of the other generals were being timid and time and time again failing to act decisively um, to attack the enemy or to follow up any advantage they might have, um, when so many of the generals were like that, he was just incredibly bold and incredibly decisive. In fact, Abraham Lincoln, the president of the time, once said about him, I need this man, he fights. Anyway, eventually he did so well, won so many key battles that he was named the overall commander of all the Union forces. He became the first three-star general since George Washington, almost a century before. 
and he ended up defeating the famous southern general, General Lee, and accepted his surrender at a place called Appomattox, which basically ended the Civil War. And he allowed Lee's troops to disarm, uh, as long as they promised not to fight anymore and to go home quietly. Uh, he didn't humiliate them. He didn't even allow his troops to cheer uh, when Lee and his troops were leaving from the surrender conference. And after the Civil War, uh, he eventually became president. And as the president, he worked hard to reunite his fractured country, and he especially poured his heart into fighting for the rights of the freed black people, the former slaves, and also of Native Americans. And sadly, in the end, he was unable to overcome uh, just most of his uh, countrymen's basic indifference to the civil rights of the minorities in America. But he never stopped fighting for them, despite the fact that even in his own party, he met with a lot of resistance. Uh, he certainly made mistakes as a president. He made some poor, choice, some poor choices in people that he appointed, but he was always willing to own up to it and to try and fix the mistakes that he had made. So he was a man of tremendous courage and moral clarity and vision. And he was a man known especially for his reasonableness and his integrity. And he died relatively young of cancer when he was in his 60s. Um, his funeral procession in New York City was at that time the largest gathering in American history, about a 1.5 million people at a time when the total population of the states was around 40 million. Uh, church bells rang uh, in unison across the country, even down into Mexico, uh, mourning his death. And one of his former enemies, a Confederate general, in fact, said this about him. He said, he was a great general, but the, <clears throat> but the best thing about him was his heart. Um, a, a Southern newspaper noted his chivalric kindness uh, to the South as a victor. And uh, Frederick Douglass, who was a former slave, and he was the foremost African-American leader of the 19th century, said this about Grant. He said, to him, more than any other man, the Negro owes his enfranchisement and the Indian a humane policy. He was accessible to all men. The black soldier was welcome in his tent and the freed man in his house. So God can do great things through people who are gentle and reasonable and fair-minded. All right, well, the second command that Paul gives in this passage is, do not be anxious. The first was, have a well-earned reputation as a gentle, reasonable, and fair-minded person. And the second is, don't be anxious. And this actually echoes Jesus' teaching in the Sermon of the Mount, which shouldn't surprise us, because Paul was Jesus' servant, Jesus' disciple. And in fact, Paul says, not just don't be anxious, he says, don't be anxious about anything, anything. Don't be anxious about COVID, he would say to us. Don't be anxious about losing your job. Don't be anxious about your children's future. Don't be anxious about money. Don't be anxious about you or your loved one's health. Don't be anxious about your standing with God. Now, that's a tough one, isn't it? I get anxious quite a bit, I must say. If Liesl goes out and she's gone longer than I expect her to be gone, I start to get anxious. Um, I get anxious if I don't feel well or if a loved one is sick. My dad dies of cancer, so sometimes I'll feel sick and I'll be like, is it cancer? You know, I get anxious very easily. So I don't do so well with don't be anxious. Um, and sort of a further question is, and, and what is this, this command of Paul? Is this like a new law I need to obey? How exactly do I become the kind of person who isn't anxious? How exactly do I become the kind of person who is reasonable and gentle? Because that is, in fact, the question. This is not about appearances. This is not about lip service to some sort of a law. This is about character and heart transformation. It's not about looking like a gentle and reasonable person. It's, a, it's about being one. It's not about looking like someone who isn't worried. It's about being the kind of person who genuinely isn't worried, but trusts God. And how do we do that? Well, I think there's two things in this passage. There's something that we need to believe, and there's something that we need to do. So first, the thing we need to believe. And what we need to believe is that the Lord is near, as Paul says. And the Lord is near in two ways. First, the Lord Jesus is present with us in the person of the Holy Spirit. 
And second, the Lord is near in that he is returning soon in glory to defeat his enemies and to vindicate his people. So Paul reminds us by this, the Lord is near, that we can't lose. However bad things may get now, our future is glorious. Uh, We're completely safe, just carried safely in Jesus' arms. Uh, It's Romans 8. Whatever we may have to go through now is less than nothing compared with the magnificent future God has in store for us and the rest of that magnificent passage. Um, I preached last week actually on rejoicing in the Lord, which covers a lot of this. So I recommend you listen to that if you haven't. And the other side of the Lord being near is that we have a very powerful and loving friend that we can turn to right now. Now this is the Paul, the horse story, this is the thing that Paul gives us to do. We're to believe that the Lord is near, and what we're to do is to pray. Because the reality is, I can't make myself into a non-anxious person by an effort of my own will. I can't make myself into a gentle, reasonable, and fear, uh, fair-minded person. I can't change my heart, but God can change my heart. You can't change your heart, but God can change your heart. Only God can do it. And how we access the presence and the power of God is through prayer. We have great promises about prayer in the Bible. Uh, In John 15, verse 7, Jesus said this. He said to his disciples, he said, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. In uh, 1 John 5, verse 14 and 15, the Apostle John says this. He says, This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of Him. And Paul reminds us to pray in a certain way. He reminds us to pray with thanksgiving. Giving thanks does something wonderful. Giving thanks reminds us of the goodness of God. As we remember how God has responded to our prayers and has blessed us in the past, our faith rises as we pray, and we are able to pray with faith for God when we have anxiety, when we have needs. We remember that God loves us and that God cares for us. We see uh, this in uh, 1 Peter Uh, Chapter 5, verse 6 and 7, Peter says this. He says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. So if we pray with thanks for whatever situation or circumstance is making us anxious, then there is a very precious promise that is ours. Now, the promise is not that we will get exactly what we pray for. Um, We can be sure that God in his goodness and in his sovereign uh, infiniteness uh, will give us what is best for us. But that's not necessarily going to be what we pray for. No, the promise here is that God will give us his peace. It says, the peace of God will guard you. Joy, peace, gentleness, and self-control, these are all fruits of the Holy Spirit. These are all things that the Holy Spirit is working into us. And by doing that, he's transforming us into the image and the character of Jesus. And the way that we grow into people who are characterized by joy and peace and patience and self-control and all these other things is through believing prayer. Now, Paul uses a wonderful picture here. He says that if we pray to God about whatever it is that we're worrying about, then God will send his peace to us. And his peace will take up residence in us. His peace will like live in us. And it will guard our hearts and our minds. This is like language like soldiers guarding a fortress. The peace of God will garrison our hearts and our minds. And if anxieties come against us, Uh, the peace of God will like shoot arrows and pour boiling oil on them and destroy them. God's peace will protect us and give us quiet hearts. 
Now, our God is faithful. He keeps his promises. And if we are anxious, then what we must do is bring our worries to him in prayer. And the promise of God here is that he will give us his peace. And it's a peace that just transcends our understanding. It's greater than anything that we can logic to or reason or understand. Uh, You can kind of think of it as a mother and her little baby. Just a little crying infant, maybe a few weeks old, uh, that, that is crying because it's sad or tired or hungry or anxious in some way, and the mother just picks it up and starts soothing it. And the baby has a very small conception of who its mother is and a very uh, limited ability to understand what's going on. But the mother's presence and her touch and her soothing voice and her smell all combines to give peace to that baby. And that's what it's like when the peace of God comes upon us. It's something greater than we can understand, but it just gives us this most amazing peace, like a baby lying in its mother's arms. So are you worried? Are you worried about something? Do you have anxiety about something? Then bring it to God in prayer. It can be about anything, Paul says, anything. If you're anxious about anything, it can be um, your children returning to school. I know a number of us are anxious about that. Uh, It could be about your health. We might be anxious about losing our job. We might be anxious about, man, I'm in my 30s. I haven't found a spouse yet. Uh, We might be anxious about whether God really exists. Maybe we have doubts that way. Uh, We might be anxious about whether God really loves us. And And Paul says, bring these anxieties, bring your needs to God in prayer, whatever they are. In fact, let's just take 10 seconds right now. Just close your eyes, open your heart, and just name whatever you are anxious about to God. Just give it to him. And as we pray in faith, Paul says, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. And I have found this to be true time and time and time again in my life. Um, So if we are worried, let's let our worries drive us to our knees in prayer. And finally, God's promise of peace is to all of those who are in Christ Jesus. That's how this passage ends, in Christ Jesus. Our relationship to God through Christ Jesus is the key to all of this. Now, as we come to trust in Jesus, to believe that although we were sinners who lived under God's condemnation, that Jesus died for sinners, that Jesus had to die to save sinners like us. And he made us righteous like God, and he has reconciled us to God, our Heavenly Father. And if we believe that the Father has raised Jesus to life so that in Christ we too might have this amazing resurrection life, then this promise is for us. Then when we pray, God will give us his peace. And this is a promise that is not just for us as individuals, but is a promise for us as a people of God. You might remember, Paul's been very concerned about the unity of the Philippians. And this peace of God is something that is for the entire church. This is something that draws the entire church together. Nothing divides a church like fear and anxiety. And nothing brings a church together like peace, like the peace of God. It's a wonderful unifying thing. And as we become people like this, as we become a people of peace, not only will we have peace in the church, I believe that we will be a wonderful and extraordinary light to the community around us. Because let's face it, this is not a time where people are feeling a lot of peace. This is a time when people are feeling a lot of anxiety. And if we are bringing our cares to God in faith through prayer and receiving his peace, We are going to shine out in this darkness. We are going to shine out to the people of Vancouver, and they're going to want to know what is the source of our peace. And that's God's plan. That's God's purpose for us here in Vancouver. Let's pray together. Yeah, 
Dear Father, we thank you so much for the precious promise of your peace that is ours through prayer. Thank you for the Lord Jesus who has made all of this possible. I pray, Father, that as we have anxiety, that we would bring it to you in prayer and that we would all know your peace, that we would know your peace together. I pray that we would be a light to this community, Lord God. I pray that we'd be a blessing to the people around us. I pray that we would shine forth your love and your peace to the people around us. And I pray, Lord God, that they would ask questions, Lord God. And I pray that we would be able to give them an answer for our peace, Lord. And just pray that this would be all to your glory. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, I just pray that you would have a wonderful week and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon.